Uh, Chairman Rubio, Ranking Member Cardin, and members of the committee, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, you've heard about the importance of entrepreneurship and jobs. I want to address the fact that technology is changing uh, both entrepreneurship and jobs. Um, rather than eliminating many types of jobs, as is often reported in the press or feared, uh, what technological change is likely to do is change the tasks that workers do in jobs. MIT researchers have gone occupation by occupation looking at the multiple tasks that are done and shown that most jobs will have tasks that are eliminated by technological change, by artificial in intelligence and machine learning, but very few, if any, jobs will be completely eliminated by that. So the future holds a world in which jobs, almost all of them, need to be redesigned. And they need to be redesigned in a way to take advantage of the comparative advantage of human workers. Preparing people for the jobs uh, the way jobs will change requires greater investment in education and worker training. Today's workers get only a few hours of training from their employers, while workers generations ago uh, received much greater uh, training from their employers. Apprenticeship programs that I know Ms. York will speak about are that receive public funding, provide compensation to workers, and encourage employers to take a chance on new workers are essential to this change. But these programs must adapt to the changing jobs of the U.S. economy. The U.S. economy is a service-based economy. 84% of workers employed in the private sector are in the services. A third of our exports is services, and these are where the good jobs are and the good exports are and where we're growing our exports. Internationally, our comparative advantage is our highly skilled workforce, but we are losing ground to other countries. To preserve our place in the global labor market, we must make sure more Americans successfully complete college. In the last century, we made it possible for nearly all Americans to get a high school degree, even though other developed countries told us it was impossible. They said some people were simply not suited for higher education, higher meaning high school. Today, we're making the same arguments about our own citizens while other developed countries succeed with a much higher percent of their citizens completing college. In the U.S., nearly two-thirds of young people start a college degree, but inadequate financial support, the challenges of raising a family while in school for some, and insufficient education prior to college, in other words, the failure of our school system before you get to college, mean that only 36 percent of people in their late 20s and early 30s have actually completed a college degree. We can and should have the majority of our young people successfully completing college. Let me address a second aspect of redesigning um, work. Total work hours may decline. The challenge is not about making sure that work doesn't decline. It's making sure that it declines only in a desired way and that it doesn't create the marginalization of communities without work. Historically, technological change has reduced work. We no longer send children into factories. We now enjoy retirement. And some people choose to stay home and raise their children, uh, focus on their families and their communities rather than work. This is not a bad thing. We have <clears throat> thought that this was a good choice. So what can we do to make sure that those, any change in ours is done in a positive way? We need to provide an infrastructure that supports working families and allows some importantly broadly shared declines in work, a decline in working while sick, a decline in working while dealing with a medical crisis of a loved one, while having a newborn in the home, people being able to afford to take time out of work and then get back to work once these crises have passed or once a newborn is ready uh, to be left uh, in childcare. Too often, people are completely pushed out of the labor force when they're forced to choose between family obligations and work. Roughly half of parents say that they have turned down a job because they could not make it work with their family needs. That's a lot of parents who are forced to make very difficult choices. Paid sick leave encourages workers to stay home when they're sick. With contagious diseases, this benefits businesses and improves overall productivity. But sick leave policies that allow workers to stay home to care for a loved one may not directly benefit their employer, but they do directly benefit society. And that's why government has a role in ensuring that all people have access to that kind of leave. Similarly, parental leave policies generate benefits for society, providing health and development benefits to children. The one last thing I want to mention 
is the importance of Congress and this committee to ensure that we are building trust in society. There's been a large decline in trust, and some of that decline in trust is connected to not having that infrastructure that supports working families. Um, <clears throat> people who do not trust other people are not themselves trustworthy, and that is a something that impedes our entrepreneurship, it impedes our economic growth, uh, because we divert resources towards monitoring people rather uh, than being more productive in our day-to-day -day world. I'll end there, thank you.